Well, it's great to be with you all. Um, it's, it's really exciting to be here. Um, I was here last year. Um, we had a, a great panel last year, and you're going to get, uh, as, as Travis mentioned, a year's update on that, and I'm excited to hear about that. Um, what I want to do for you is uh, give you a sense of what's happening uh, from an automation, overall automation standpoint in self-storage facilities, not only just in the United States, but, but globally. And then um, I'm going to, I am going to take a, a, about a quarter of my presentation and talk about remote management. And I've got um, a video to show you from uh, an operator that's actually in Australia that I think you'll find uh, very intriguing called Swift Storage and what they're, uh, they're doing from a remote management standpoint um, with their facilities and what their strategy is uh, for building out um, a portfolio. Um, with uh, remote management. So um, I think most of you know me. I, I do, I guess, a, a couple of pieces that are probably important. One was I was uh, previously the CEO of CenterShift, which was sold to Yardi, so I was in the property management software arena. Um, my condolences to you, Lance. Um, but I, I actually think uh, what Tenna is doing is really uh, phenomenal. I also spent some time with Travis on the SSA uh, Board of Directors and um, just got asked to uh, uh, join the board of the Self-Storage Association of Asia. Um, so they're a fledgling uh, uh, association over there but uh, have you know the same issues and are looking at the same things. Went uh, to Singapore after I was in Australia and um, spoke on a panel there and then saw some of the facilities that uh, they're doing and what they're doing with, with remote management. I mean, it's, it's a hot topic and, and everybody's looking at what they're going to do. And we'll talk about what the REITs in my presentation are looking to do and kind of what they're signaling with some of the acquisitions that they've made. All right, so just uh, real quickly, what are you going to learn today so you have a sense of uh, where we're going to go? I'm going to talk about why automation is important for, uh, for self-storage operators and tenants. Um, then we're going to um, talk about how it's being used at self-storage facilities around the world, the key elements of an automated facility, uh, how it's being used to remotely manage, as I mentioned, uh, how to implement automation at your facility, and uh, just some guesses at where we're going from an automation standpoint in the industry going forward. We'll see, uh, we'll see how good I am at predicting that. All right, so why is um, uh, automation important for self-storage uh, uh, operators and operations? And we got a really good purview into that yesterday. By the way, kudos, Lance, to you and your team. Some of the stuff I saw yesterday was stuff that we were thinking about when I was at Center Shift, you know, seven years ago, and you guys have done it. Um, and I'll start right um, with customer acquisition. The website stuff that you saw yesterday was great. It was amazing. It was, it's what the REITs have been doing for some time, and um, I think it's really key to, to capturing um, and, and onboarding uh, tenants. So uh, great job with that. So um, why is automation important? It's so important for customer acquisitions, you know, in terms of uh, utilization of your website, what your onboarding experience is, um, how you're using call centers, especially when it comes to remotely managing your facilities, and obviously access control. Second thing is facility operations. You can read down the list. You guys, uh, I don't have to tell you what overlocking is. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that Lance mentioned yesterday that we're looking at helping out on as well as move out. Um, some of the data that we're collecting is starting, as we look at it, is starting to, to show us and signal when somebody's going to move out. So what can we use that data for to help maybe keep them at the facility or make sure that they refer uh, their friends and neighbors to you or that they come back to you when they need self-storage again? And then report, uh, reporting and oversight. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are obviously happening in that area. The reporting capability that Lance and his team showed you yesterday, again, phenomenal. Um, you know, we, we built out a lot of reports. Um, and the, the ability for you guys to be able to build the reports on the fly, specifically for your operations the way you want to see it, I think is fantastic. So... And you can read the other items as, uh, as well there. Um, 
And by the way, you don't have, you're not going to have to listen to me the entire time here. I do have three videos I'm going to show you, one of which some of you may have seen. Uh, we'll show off one of uh, Travis's facilities, but I'm going to uh, show you a couple other videos as well during the presentation. One is on a new facility that's uh, for big boy toys out in um, Bakersfield, and then we'll show you a video about uh, the remotely managed facility uh, that's in Brisbane, Australia. All right, so why is um, automation important for you as self-storage operators? Well, one is the expectations in terms of your tenants and what they expect in terms of an, an experience in interacting with you and onboarding with you um, has the bar has been raised. COVID did that to some degree, but it was already occurring, you know, prior to that. I think this is something that um, tenant uh, with the um, some of the experiences that uh, they were providing um, on the front end um, showed some of that. And, and basically, is, is you want to be able to enhance the customer experience and their interaction with you. Um, it may be all digital. Um, it may be, you know, interacting with um, a site manager or whatever. But the, the, the fact is they want to be able to do anywhere, anytime rentals, especially as the demographics are changing and your tenants are becoming younger, at least younger to many of us in the room, right? Right, Brian? <laughs> Um, they want to interact with us differently. They want to they want to interact like they're buying something off of uh, Amazon, right? And of course, we all learned about contactless rentals uh, during COVID. But there's there's other benefits as well from automation. Obviously, uh, it provides the opportunity to to improve your operational efficiencies. Um, we learned about some of those yesterday as well. Um, provide a more competitive and differentiated product. Um, you know, certainly if we look at what Travis was doing in, in uh, uh, his Dove Mountain facility in Marina, he was, he, f for a long period of time, and even, even probably till today, he, he very much differentiated his facility in that, in that area with the automation that he was using there. Um, it says potentially reduce labor costs. The reality is that's probably one of the biggest things um, that we're seeing and why remotely managed facilities is such a hot button right now um, because you can reduce uh, your labor costs. And, you know, I'm sure I would get everyone to raise their hands if we talked about how difficult it is just to get labor uh, in today's environment, today's market, okay? And then, uh, obviously, increased revenue and NOI. You have the ability to now identify your heavy users. Your site managers probably knew who some of those were, but if you have a large portfolio, you uh, may not have known who they are. Now we know when they're coming, what units they're going to, how often they're there, how many digital key shares they've shared. Um, you know, And so we have a much better idea of who your heavy users are, who's putting more burden on your facility than the guy that you know, doesn't come but once a year or twice a year. Um, also, we're seeing uh, customers um, having success with both premium unit offerings and automation fees, um, where they're tacking on, you know, they're, they're automating their facility, the customers can see that, and then they're adding on an automation fee and not getting a lot of resistance from their customers because they can see what's um, what's what's it been invested in their facility. And then ultimately, the bottom line is impact your facility valuation, okay? All right, so why is automation important for self-storage tenants? We talked about some of these. I won't repeat them, obviously, anytime, anywhere rentals. I mean, uh, we've got lots and lots of examples. I mean, I've got um, AJ and Travis at the back here, both of whom I have on record and maybe on video, um, talking about guys that, uh, you know, come to the facility or gals, at 2 a.m. in the morning, you know, on a Sunday, and rent a unit. Um, and, you know, they got, they captured that customer versus, you know, a competitor who was not able to do that. Um, I think most of these others are pretty self-forward. It was interesting um, what Tenant was talking about in terms of site mapping. We see that as a real key as well um, at Janus. I think that's going to be something that's going to be really beneficial uh, to tenants as we get better and better at that. And then digital key share, um, man, I, digital key share was, it was kind of a, uh, a little bit of a hidden benefit that we 
suddenly realize that we were, we're really onto something. Um, this is the ability for uh, customers to uh, share a digital key uh, to anyone that they so choose. And now, um, you know, whether it's a spouse, significant other, kids, uh, employees, whatever, they have the ability to, to let them get in the facility. And it, it does a number of things. One is it allows much easier access control that you know about because you know who these people are, right? It's not someone that they shared a gate code with and you have no idea who's on your facility property. Now you know who they are. Not only that, now there you have someone that you can potentially market to that it, that's experiencing self-storage, right? Um, so, and the other thing is, is that we've discovered, and again, we go back to how important data is. The more data, the more digital key shares you have, the stickier that tenant is. Um, so, again, whether it's you know just understanding that that piece of information, but you know ultimately what you can do with it, right? In terms of revenue management, for example, they are a very sticky customer because they're getting a lot of value out of your self storage facility. And then obviously we have the tenant we have tenant convenience side, we have the tenant security side. Um, you know, they can see uh, activity. You can have, a, let's say, a lawn care guy that's got a bunch of employees um, coming to get the lawn care equipment at your facility. Now he knows who's coming, when they're showing up, what unit they're going to. Um, so it gives that tenant more of a purview in terms of, you know, what's happening at his unit and, you know, with his employees if he's using it, um, you know, from a commercial standpoint. We also have some things in terms of zoning and activ activity logs so that, you know, the customers can, can see what's going on, plus it limits where they can go, you know, on the facility. Um, video surveillance, um, especially as you move to remote management, um, continues to be, you know, really important um, just to, you know, see what's going on in the facility. I mean, you know, um, I think most of you probably had the experience of some guy breaking in and in a hoodie and you can't tell who it is, but the reality is, with video surveillance, especially from a remote management standpoint, you, you get a purview on, in terms of what's going on at your facility. Um, and tenant tracking. We, we now have, I mean, you've, your tenants have a digital device, a mobile device that they're walking around your facility. Um, and it, as long as they they've, um, are, are using the application uh, and that allows them access to the facility, we can not only tell when they're going through an entry point or opening a unit, we know where they are on your facility, which can aid from a security standpoint as well. Okay, um, so you don't have to just take my word for it. Um, we did a, a survey that I think uh, was very uh, interesting. Um, and this is the response to uh, the survey about automation technology. We pulled about 25,000 active tenants um, and asked them about uh, their buying and technology preferences uh, in self-storage. Um, this was done in about 38 states and three provinces. We asked them uh, whether they would rad rather use a mobile phone to open the lock or use a standard padlock. Not surprisingly, 87% um, of them uh, indicated that they would rather use a uh, mobile phone or app to open a lock as opposed to, you know, using a padlock. Um, and then we asked them to rank the features that were most important in a, in a uh, smart entry system. The first one being no padlock key to lose and no gate code to forget. And, you know, quite frankly, um, there's, there's more to that. When you think about how many times your call center or your people are getting called to help a tenant out because they've forgotten their gate code, think about what the cost is um, in terms of providing that to them. Um, if you're using a call center, it's probably 8 to $10 every time uh, one, of those, one of your tenants call you about that. We talked about digital key share and how um, important that's become. And from a tenant perspective, that's their number two item, uh, being able to view their unit activity and then the fact that they've got motion sensors inside their unit gives them uh, some peace of mind in terms of, uh, you know, what's happening in inside their unit. Okay, so um, this is actually becoming a, a bit of a, a older video. It's probably one of the oldest videos we have, right, Travis? Um, but I think it really, it still shows off the fact that 
Um, regardless of the demographic, regardless of where your self-storage facility is and what the demographic is in that three to five mile, um, people love using their digital technology to access self-storage. So Travis, uh, this video was done at um, Dove Mountain, which is in Marana. It's a retirement community. I'd say economically it's kind of upper end, right? Um, and I'll let the tenants speak for their experience with uh, automation. When I walk down the aisle, and I, can, I don't have to be right here to open it, and it, I can hear the sound, and I open it up, and it's done. My husband and I are self-employed artists. Right now, I like the ease of just coming in, hearing the click, opening the door, and starting to work. Well, it, you know, it's nice that that's on my phone. It's, it's, nowadays, everybody has their phone all the time. It's one less thing to worry about, so I have it with me all the time. The new system that you have is an added layer of security for us, so it gives me peace of mind. It's like any other app. You go to the app store and download it, and it shows right up. You know, and I've only used it a few times, but I have been down here by myself, which was, you know, it's easy for my age. <laughs> We've got two, you know, units right now, and it was easy because they light up when you come in. It's really an easy system. You can bring in other people to it. Uh, so my wife, I helped her download it on her iPhone. Very easy to work with. It's just easy to use. Very convenient. I love the Noki Smart Entry System because I don't have to see if I remembered to bring my key with me, which for anyone who knows me, remembering is a big issue. So I always have my phone with me as a realtor so I can always get into the system. It's very handy. I don't have to take an extra key, and it works every time. It's seamless. Uh, I click it, and it opens, and I can even get back in without having to carry that key or, or try to jam the uh, slider. Oh, very secure. No problem there. I think it's a great system. Travis, do you have any millennials in your facility at all? <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> but the reality is that your tenant set's going to turn over here in the next five to ten years anyway, right? <laughs> who, who's, the, who's the number one generation right now of, of our product? Do you, uh, you're asking me or do you? Oh, know? I, know, I mean, I know the answer. Everybody knows the answer, right? Millennials, number one user of our product. Who, who five years ago was writing every article – Waving the red flag that storage was over. We were doomed. Millennials will never use our product, right? That was all of you. So Are you going to put the blame on all of them? When you look at these trends, I am. I am I'm calling you all out. Um, it, was, it was top of mind topic in the industry, right? It wasn't the case. So keep an open mind on some of the things you're seeing, right? Because you may, you may be you know, looking at some really good information that you're not perceiving today. But you might you might find value there. All right. Well, uh, thanks for uh, letting, letting me share that uh, video, Travis. Um, I've always loved that facility. Of course, I've been to every single unit in that facility. So, um, so how is automation being used at self-storage facilities? We've touched on some of these, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, Again, can't overemphasize the website piece. Again, based on what I saw yesterday, um, you know, there's some great tools available to you. And that spans into onboarding as well because that experience is typically happening via uh, the website, whether it's uh, mobile enabled or not. Um, more often than not, mobile enabled. Your property management software, probably one of the most important decisions that you will make as a self-storage operator. And I can say that based on previously managing a property management software company. Um, so, and the, the capabilities you can see there. And I think, you know, we, we saw some great flexibility. What, what, I, what I saw yesterday was uh, great flexibility to you as an owner-operator. Um, and quite frankly, pretty easy uh, ease of use in terms of setting those things up. 
Um, signage. Well, you probably think, why has he got signage up there? Well, the reality is, is that signage is still really important um, at self-storage facilities, whether they're uh, operated as traditional facilities, and even more important, as we'll talk about, from a remotely managed uh, facility. You need to have really good signage. And then the benefit to mobile device access, I think, kind of goes without saying. You've, you, you saw the demographic there and what they were saying about it, right? Um, you know, these smartphones are ubiquitous now. I mean, it's, it's uh, you, it, you know, five years ago it was 80% of the people in the United States have mobile phones is probably more like 90%. And you go to some of the uh, some of the countries I've been to in Europe, I'm not sure there's anyone that doesn't have uh, a smartphone. Okay, um, how is it being used um, at self storage facilities? Lots of um, lots of interesting things and more to come. Um, let's talk about video surveillance and monitoring. Um, we've got license plate recognition. Uh, we've got unit motion sensors in the unit, so um, you know you can be notified if someone has gotten into the unit that shouldn't be in there, or if you've got somebody that's uh, sleeping in a unit, for example. Um, from an operational uh, tool and activity tracking standpoint, we've got automated overlocking now um, because we're controlling the individual unit, right? We can auto automatically overlock that. Um, so that's a process that. Um, doesn't have to be done by a site manager anymore. Digital key, uh, lock checks, um, you know, securing vacant units. So again, if you go to remotely managed facilities, you need to be securing those units, or you may end up having tenants that you didn't want to have or know that you had. Um, remote management. Um, we're going to talk more about that, so I won't get into that. Site maps. I, I touched on and how valuable I think that's going to be um, in the future. Um, not only for us as operators, but also your tenants. And then some things that, um, you know, you may not have considered. I mean, marketing, you know, we've, we've, we've uh, been in a situation where occupancies are in the 90s. Um, a lot of you as operators have stopped uh, your pay-per-click, although I'm, I'm guessing you've maybe started that back up again. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're now having to, to market as your churn has increased, Right. Well, there's also new uh, capabilities um, coming in. Certainly chatbots is one of those. Um, Travis alluded to that um, with Swivel. But, um, you know, certainly with digital key sh uh, share users, you have the opportunity now to market to them. Um, referral, you, obviously referral incentives, digital referral in incentives, mobile device banners, surveys, all of that, you know, has become more, more and more important um, to you. Especially, you know, you talk about surveys and reputation management, right? Um, there's lots of guys that have automated that process and made it so that, uh, you know, they've got very, very good reputation um, in the in the markets they're in. Um, last couple things on this before we move to remote management. Um, this just gives you an idea of some of the things that we're doing um, from a software perspective and presenting to. Uh, you as owner operators or your site managers um, in terms of what we call our web portal. So you have a purview into the facility from an access control standpoint that you never had before. Um, you can see who's coming in, when they're coming in, who your most um, uh, who you, who the tenants are they're using your facility the most. Um, you know, whole whole host of things that. Um, you didn't have the ability to see or, or view uh, in the past. And then we talked about site mapping. Um, for us, this is uh, more about unit status and unit temperatures and battery status and lock status, um, all of those things um, presented to you. But then we can overlay that. And, you know, just like Lance yesterday, I'm, I'm not selling futures here, but the reality is, is we can also now track your tenants and your site managers, if you've got site managers, as they peruse the facility. So we know where they are, right? And you know where they are. Maybe you've got a site manager that's, you know, never leaves the office, right? You would be able to tell that. Okay, so um, just to reiterate, um, you know, the key elements of an automated facility and um, I think the panel this afternoon and certainly the, the discussions will, will 
have uh, will and have touched on these things. So I'm not going to go over them again. But, um, you know, clearly there are uh, a lot of key elements to automated facilities, and especially as you get into remote management, which is what we're going to talk after I show you this video. So let me show, set up this video. It's kind of a, one of those fun videos. It's uh, There's no... Um, uh, dialogue in the video. It's a facility that we just finished. It's in Bakersfield, California, so not too far from here. And um, it's called uh, Titan Mega Storage. So it's really for big boy toys. And um, I, I want you, as you're, as you're uh, viewing the video, and I'll probably comment on it, to just kind of look at all the different automation that's going into it and what a cool facility this is. I found that to be kind of fun. I know. Uh, where's John? Is John in here right now? Oh, maybe Rich knows. Do, we, do you know what the occupancy is in this facility now? Because it just no. Nope. Um, I, I know he's been. He's had a lot of fun with that. The, the, the owner and um, you, obviously he's got a, a very unique setup there in terms of uh, the storage uh, units that are there. They have. He has traditional units there as well. They're all big though. Um, in that market, he decided that that was uh, the way he wanted to go. And you could see all the automation that was uh, employed there as well. So mm -hmm. just kind of a, a fun video. All right. So let's shift gears now. Uh, in the last about 10 minutes, I'm going to just talk about remotely uh, managed facilities. And um, obviously, COVID changed the dynamic here, but it was already happening. And this is happening around the world, whether it's Asia Europe or here in North America, there is a lot that's going on from a remotely managed facility standpoint. And I think one key indicator of how important this is going to be and what's going to happen in the future is uh, some acquisitions that the two largest REITs made last year. First of all, Extra Space acquired Bargold, and then they acquired uh, Storage Express, right? And what have they, um, I guess kind of shown with their hand on that is one is they're going to look to to put self storage in apartment you know multifamily apartment complexes you know across the country um, with what they did with Bargold and then with Storage Express one they have another brand and don't be surprised if you see more brands um, and two they've got an operator that um, you know remotely managed over a hundred facilities so that was expertise that they had, a model they had. Now, I think they'll. I think that Extra Space will put a um, will add additional uh, technology to what uh, Jefferson Shreve was doing with that. But I think it's very intriguing what they were doing. Now, the other thing you might not know is that Public Storage actually tried to acquire Storage Express prior to Extra Space uh, coming in and. Uh, maybe sneaking the deal out from, from underneath them, all right? So these guys are really 
interested in what's going on from a, a remotely uh, managed uh, perspective. So then what does public storage do? So public storage uh, bought a portfolio here last year of, of about 40 uh, self-storage facilities that are being remotely managed uh, north of Orlando. And um, talking to their CFO um, earlier, I guess it was last month, um, I think they're going to be tri doing trials and, and uh, figuring out you know, what will work uh, for them and uh, p potentially deploying across their portfolio of 2,800 facilities. So, um, and we see the same thing in Europe. Um, we have a very large player o over there that's now, um, that's in Sweden. Uh, Nuveen, if any of you know those guys, you know, they're an investor, for example, in extra space storage here in the United States. They bought green storage. Then they bought uh, 24 storage. They put them together, green storage. Both of them had a remotely managed model, but green storage had taken it to, to a much higher level. And now uh, those 40 facilities, all of which are in um, Sweden, um, are all going to be remotely managed. Um, and uh, the same is true. Uh, I'll, I'll be showing you a video about Swift storage, and I'll talk more about then that. Now, what are the key elements that are maybe somewhat different for, for a remotely managed uh, facility that you need to focus on? Um, the first one is, is that we talk about, um, a lot of people say unmanned. I think that's the wrong terminology. I mean, there's no man or woman necessarily at the facility, but they're, they are remotely managed. They are virtually managed. The guys that are having success with that, right? So if a customer has an issue or a problem, or whatever, they can still get a hold of somebody. Um, we've seen that, like, um, for instance, it's really been taken uh, uh, to kind of the nth degree here in the United States uh, with a company called Stories, right, where they're actually greeted by someone uh, from a video conference standpoint as soon as the door opens on the, on the, uh, on the, um, the rental center. Um, but regardless of how that's being done, the, the facilities, the concept needs to be that you're remotely managed, but you are either taking your best site managers, in this case, or you're hiring people um, that have uh, a, a different skill set, if you will, um, that you're paying more, but you're leveraging, you're leveraging them across multiple facilities. Now, I don't, I, I've heard lots of different uh, data points on this. I, I think, based on what I've heard around the world, that we'll probably see uh, a ratio of maybe eight facilities to one, um, you know, virtual manager, if you will. You think about the cost savings that can come from that, and yet the customer still can have almost the same experience, and in many cases, a better experience in coming to the facility. And um, I think maybe um, I've got some guys that think they can stretch that to 10 or to 12. Maybe if they're all leased up, um, I think, you know, the equation changes when you're leasing up a facility um, and you've got more, you know, more transactions that are occurring there. Or if you're just a, you know, a high transaction facility. But the reality is whether it's 4 to 1 or 8 to 1 or 12 to 1, um, there's considerable savings that come from that. Um, obviously, we've got to handle the what I call the last mile of self-storage. Um, Travis and, and um, uh, uh, you know referred to that. Um, you got to have individual unit access control. You got to be securing that unit when it's vacant and um, allowing the customer to access that unit, you know, uh, um, digitally. You need to have a robust onboarding experience so the customer can handle that and hopefully do that without even having to involve you or your virtual manager, right? Um, and if needed, you need to have good tenant communication. Obviously, video surveillance, you know, if someone decides that they, they're going to toss a mattress out in the middle of your dry aisle, you kind of need to know that that's going to happen, which also means to your kind of your maintenance plan, you do need to have someone that's going there on a regular basis, Right? Um, so if you look at what Jefferson Shreve was doing, he had about 20 trucks. Um, his facilities, this is Storage Express, uh, Indiana um, area. I think he had some in Illinois as well. Um, and he just had these guys on route, so they were seeing, you know, X number of facilities a day 
making sure everything was fine. He, they, I think he was using blister packs, so he was putting, you know, having them put blister packs in, in checking units that had been moved out of, making sure the dumpster, you know, didn't have you know, garbage overflowing and so forth. So it's not like you're not touching these. Yes. So in the case of uh, Jefferson, um, they had about 100, 110 facilities, and they had about 20 maintenance guys. So I haven't done the math in my head, but, um, you know, they, they were probably hitting four or five facilities a day. Uh, yeah. Um, now, I, I, you know, I look at what Green Storage is doing um, in um, Stockholm, Sweden. They're hitting them once a week. So they've, you know, they've decided that that's, um, and, I, and I know others where it's just on, they've got someone that's on call. So if there's, uh, if they determine they've got an issue or they've just had a bunch of move outs or whatever, then, you know, that person gets scheduled to go out there. So I, you know, there's not a definitive model, if you will, but very good question. Okay. Um, and then remote unlocking, um, obviously from an access control standpoint, a person can't get in the in or out of the facility for some reason, or uh, they want to see a unit. Um, you know, so be able to open vacant units so that uh, a person can go take a look at it and then it can be resecured, right? Okay, let me t let me uh, set the stage for the Swift uh, storage facility. This is in Brisbane, Australia. Um, John Perrins, a few of you guys in here might know John. He's been in the self storage industry for a long time. Randy's shaking her head. Um, great guy. Um, he actually has two platforms. Um, he has a traditional platform. Uh, you know, I call them super centers, you know, super self-storage. Um, he is having that be third-party managed uh, by a company called Abacus under the Storage King name in Australia. But he has now created a separate brand, which is Swift Storage. These are at infill sites um, around... In this case, Brisbane, which is a major metropolitan, I think it's the third largest city um, in Australia, and he plans to expand that. He's got five facilities open right now. They're all remotely managed, um, and he plans by the end of next year to have 20 facilities under this model. So let me show you the video, and he can kind of explain it itself. I think it's very interesting where he talks about uh, how he's using technology. Swift Storage is a project designed to deliver very simple storage solutions. That's actually what people expect. They're going to go and rent a unit, drive in, park your car in front of a unit, no padlocks, lift your roller door and unload their vehicle and load it and go out. And that's why we call Swift. It's, it's fast. The key of this is technology and it's not a people delivered experience. It's a technology delivered experience. It's probably very similar to going to the airport and using a, a kiosk to check in. While it might take 40 minutes to rent a unit at a large man facility, we want to do it under a minute using the Noki access system. Hi, I'm John Perrins. I'm one of the co-developers of Swift Storage. I have had 35 years in the self-storage industry. We're one of the first people in Australia to have the Noki system. We're definitely the first person in Australia to have Janus roller doors. It's been great. We've got the Noki on basically every part of the facility. See the size Having of Noki house. gives us full control. It also gives us the customers more control. They can issue extra keys. It's purely up to them. It's their security. It's for them to manage. We're hoping to continue this relationship with Janice and Noki. We've got many more stores planned. Noki is at the heart and soul and the beginning of this whole project, and we look forward to the future with Noki. So again, the model is infill sites um, where traditionally you probably couldn't make a self-storage facility pencil. Um, the, the unit counts on these sites is uh, 200 to 300 units, um, and they are all remotely managed. So they do have uh, you know phone number up on the, the site so someone can be called if, if um, they run into an issue or whatever. And... Um, I got to, to be out and, and hang out on one of those sites uh, here a couple months ago. And, you know, phenomenal, phenomenal experience. It was great to watch the customers and how they interacted. And they've had, they have a, they've had a great experience with it. And um, he, plans, he plans another 15 sites around Brisbane. And then I 
suspect, although I haven't really been able to pin him down on it, that he plans to take this to other metropolitan areas uh, in Australia. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, just a, a, a couple things. Uh, usually it's um, older um, tenants who um, can't remember what or how to um, do uh, – that what their password is uh, to get into um, either uh, iTunes or, or Google uh, Play. So that's the, the biggest problem. Yeah. Yeah, we have our own. We actually have two different types. We have a, a smaller, slimmer one that um, can go on, you know, uh, um, individual entry points. And now we have our screen one that can be branded with your brand. It has information that they can read on a color screen and um, has a, a larger uh, keys on it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's actually I don't know if you guys all heard that. The question was, is there a plan B for someone that doesn't have a smartphone? It's interesting the feedback um, that I've gotten from operators. So uh, some of them have said we don't want them as a customer. If they don't have a smartphone, we do not want them as a customer. So it weeds them out um, right off the bat. For those that do, we do have a uh, a Bluetooth fob that can be used um, to get into the entry points and into their individual units. I would say that um, we probably only see 2 to 3% of, of tenants use that on facilities where they can. Um, quite frankly, the bigger thing right now is we just don't want them as a customer. Yes? Uh, you spoke earlier about um, data that you're collecting. Um, are you guys sharing that with, uh, with the, if we sign up with the operator uh, to, you know, to be able to track them. Also, with the key fob, uh, we, we have no key one at one of our facilities. We're installing it at another right now. With the, the key fob, I thought that was going to be a really big deal. It's, it, it isn't just that we don't, it, it, we, I don't take that, I, I, I'm not, I don't have, I'm not saying, oh, we don't want you if you don't want to use the, if you want the key fob. We are happy to rent it with the key fob, but it's a pain, and it doesn't work as well in terms of what the customer has. On so their phone. On their phone. I mean, they can open the gate with their phone. They can access the unit with their phone. I can, I got a call, and somebody couldn't get in because they didn't download the app because we had just converted to it. And I was in Morro Bay out to eat with my my family, and I was able to like talk to the lady, send her the link off of my phone. She got in, got her stuff. She was a college student. She was unfortunately moving out, but you know, <laughs> it's it really it's it, it's it was pretty amazing. Right. So you were virtually managing your facility. While I was yeah. yeah yeah. So back to your first question. Um, or, or the, the, the well, the key fob thing. Yeah. The customers, they, they don't, they don't work as well. And most, they gave us twenty for free. You guys gave me twenty. I mean, I don't know. We really gave them to you for free. No, <laughs> I'm sure it's on the bill somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, we just pass them out to people that want them, and I think we pass out five out of the twenty. Yeah, it's it's a very f small percentage. Just yeah. So um, it, the, when, the, when, when you um, have a customer that wants a fob, you're selling them a fob, I would assume. I was going to sell them. But the thing is, is nobody wants them. So you're, you're going to sell three of them? It's a, and mark them up to, I think, I, think them, I, think it's, I think they're $25 or $30, something like that. And we can sell them for 35 if somebody really wanted them. And it got to, I was like, had him, and I had him in the, 
POS system, like, oh, I'm going to be making some money off of this. <laughs> You're better off just raising your rent after you install the, the system. But you didn't answer the question about the, uh, I'm sorry. You didn't answer the question about the data. Are you going to share that? Ah, that's what it was. So first of all, um, our MSAs, I think, and I think this is really important, Lance, I'm assuming that um, we're on the same page here, is, is it's your data, and we contractually, we say you own your data. Now, we'll present that data back to you. Um, we do use it um, as we're looking for, you know, things that that data can, can tell us that we can then ultimately provide back to you. But if, if you want your data, we'll give you your data. We have APIs available for you to take the, the data. Um, I think we only have one or two customers right now that are, that are taking the data because most operators don't have the ability to, to manage that data. But. Okay. Hey, uh, Terry, co commentary and yeah. something I think for everybody in the room to pay attention to um, because I think sometimes unless, unless you see an orange door do it or a green door do it, you don't, I don't know how much you look, but over the past 12 months between acquisitions and failed acquisitions, the REITs have laid down almost a billion dollars in entering this space of remote management. And that's in the form of buying companies that have models that they want to understand. That's in the form of buying tech companies that they think are going to be integral to handling those things. It's in the form of reducing their labor cost. And public storage is actually maybe failing on the acquisition side and has made some big failures there, but has succeeded on some of the models that they're after and is really leading the pack in the reduction of expense, on-site expense, uh, at, a, at, a, at a pretty big clip. The door is as critical as your website, really, in this model if you want to have automation, um, you know. If you, if you recognize that at a certain point you're going to live in this world, um, even if you're not ready to completely immerse in this world, I suggest you at least put your foot in the water because had you waited to get online with your business today, you'd be so far behind in what you've learned and your experience. And it's one of the reasons we bought, we bought Noki one day one, and it was tough and it was rough. Like, took a lot of bruises doing it. And it was a big, it, I mean, it wasn't cheap. It was 250, 300,000 or something we put into it at that, at that store. And I didn't care um, really how successful it was with my investment. What I cared about is I knew that in a relatively short period of time, it is going to be a key element, that door access to our business model. And I wanted to start learning. And I started, and I've learned a lot. And, you know, would I develop a new facility without looking at that? No way. Wouldn't do it. Just as I wouldn't imagine going to an investor and asking them to invest in a storage facility that have no web presence. But, you know, by the time they got done laughing on the floor. Just as the last five investments I've made in self-storage over the last two years, the very first thing I said is, there's a brand you're going to run on or I'm not interested because I know the efficiencies there. Why would I invest in something that I know could make more money? So, you don't, it, this is no longer um, a U.S. thing. This is a global thing. And you need to start looking at this. And, you know, there'll be multiple products in this space doing this at some point. But you've got to look at this control point because remote management is here to stay. And, it, and I think you, I feel, I feel like you coined my words up on one of those slides. It's a reallocation of your labor. You're reallocating your labor to its best and highest use to run your facility, which if you do it right, you also lower your total cost. You should put the right person at the right place at the right time. That's very powerful. And guess what? We don't know this, but we've all been doing it for three years, haven't we? 
How many of your staff are all in the office all the time right now? Very few of us, right? We reality, we, we worked remotely. We ran our businesses remotely. So this is this is you know this is the new the new um, and and long lasting element of efficiency that we're coming out the backside of this thing with. So you really are my chatbot, Lance. <laughs> Appreciate that. But no. the, the, the point is well taken, and I couldn't have said it better myself. My last slide, where are we going? Um, just to give you a, a little purview in terms of what I think the future is going to hold. Um, I think we've talked about data and data mining probably ad nauseum, but if you look at the REITs, it's, it's abs- absolutely the most important thing to them is the data. The other things are great, but they want the data. Um, Robots and drones, um, I think we're going to see more and more of that. Some of the uh, initial uh, stuff that we saw wasn't all that great, but it's getting better and better and lower cost and um, more capability. So I think we're going to see uh, uh, robots and drones. I've seen a drone uh, solution in Europe that, um, while it's really expensive right now, was you know was pretty cool. Automated doors goes without saying, of course. So you can also, today, you can have a drone greet you and uh, have a, a, a pad, you know, with a, a virtual manager on the other end of it, if you'd like. Um, you know, that, that capability is there, whether it makes sense or not. Yeah, we have a client in Toulouse, France, and they have a robot that will greet you at the door and you can just do two or three trade with them or whatever. And so that's a nice thing that the whole United States is really interested in. Yeah. You know, if robots are cooking your McDonald's lunch, you know, eventually it's going to make it uh, self-storage, right? Chatbots we've talked about. Of course, Lance is the ultimate chatbot. But really, there's some pretty interesting stuff that's coming there, although I I, I worry about uh, what control those chatbot companies can have. Um, Move-out process. You alluded to this, I think, Lance, yesterday. This is an area that needs help um, that we've got to get better at. And I think there's some things we're working on. I'm sure others are as well to improve the, the move-out process. Video <laughs> surveillance, license mm-hmm. plate recognition is happening today. Facial recognition is certainly there. Many of us that traveled, uh, you know, had facial recognition used on us to, you know, get in past security or to get on an in- international flight, right? I don't know. I, I actually... Uh, at a, a, a presentation that I gave, I'm trying to remember, I think it was still in the U.S., I said, I don't think anybody in self-storage is using facial recognition yet. And a guy raised his hand and told me that he was using it. So that really kind of surprised me. I, I wouldn't think in the United States that facial recognition would be something that... Um, is anybody using it in here? Yeah, yeah we got a couple. Well, I mean, if yeah. we're using we're, yeah. technology... Yeah. So we're validating their So but you're just capturing the image off the license, right? No. Are you so you're no. and then you're using it to validate Bi- their, Yeah, biometrics we're we're okay. comparing. I got I got to change shot. my tune there. I didn't know you guys were doing that. Yeah. But there we've got on our panel uh, Adam Wagner is using Great. We want to hear about that on the panel. I'll give you an example real quick. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd pay attention also if you want to if you want to focus in on areas and just listen in and try to unpack what you're hearing. The the most powerful sensor um, in the world is video, and and it's being driven the hardest, the fastest, primarily through through driverless vehicles and all the technology and the billion billions and billions being poured in there. But we're we're all experiencing massive you know, not we, the entire country is experiencing more crime. And probably the least expensive, most effective tool is video. But repackage how you're thinking about it. 
it's not the same methodology, it's not the same camera, it's not mounted on the side of the building, right? But there's a tremendous upside to, to video. Along with it would come facial recognition and other elements. Yeah. Last couple things, IoT. You know, today we're we're doing temperature and humidity tracking, but there's you know there's going to be more and more sensors, and and then site management and tenant tracking. I alluded to, um, you know, we've got a digital device we can track. You know, that person going around the facility. So, all right. So we covered these things. I won't cover them again. Um, hopefully, we we touched on everything. And um, yeah. thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Sarah.